Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Crystal Thomas. I'm one of the members of the steering committee for the project managers group. Um, and this summer, we were lucky enough to have so many volunteers. We're doing two webinars on project management with external partners. And this is part two. Um, part one, I just got the recording link for so that will be going out uh, shortly. And then this will also be recorded today. We will record all the presentations and then stop the recording for the Q&A. Um, so folks feel comfortable to ask any questions that they may prefer not to have recorded. Um, while our speakers are talking, please feel free to put questions into the chat, but we will hold and address all questions after all four of our wonderful presenters are done today. Um, and in, uh, again, uh, you are welcome to have your camera on, but please make sure you are muted as uh, folks are talking. Um, and I will also be in the chat if you have any questions uh, as the presenters go forward. Um, but we are going to start today with Amy Bacco. So Amy, take it away. Thank you. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And um, thank you for having me here today um, and the offer to present Crystal. Uh, my name is Amy Bacco. I am the Digital Projects Librarian at Western Michigan University. And I want to talk a little bit about um, a campus community uh, partnership in building digital collections and uh, kind of lessons learned. So I was new to uh, my institution in Michigan in 2018, and I found that there's a large local history um, community uh, that gets together regularly, and I was invited to join and connected with a lot of other folks uh, doing similar work. And I found that once you uh, show up and your title includes digital, you're going to field a lot of questions. So I had um, a few a few folks reach out with um, interest um, about um, doing site visits, um, kind of giving them some advice and welcoming me and uh, familiarizing me to uh, the community. So the way that this all came to be was um, the lo these local cultural heritage museum um, organizations had these um, similar needs for resources and expertise, and also a desire to um, start working in, in digital collections. So the first place that uh, contacted me was the Gilmore Car Museum. Um, I believe it's the largest car museum in North America. Um, they had um, a library and a, a large amount of unprocessed archives. Um, they really had some interesting materials and there's definitely a demand for the, the uh, materials they had, so they wanted to build this online presence. The second organization was the Richland uh, Community Library. It's a small rural library um, kind of in this um, kind of vacation-ish destination in southwest Michigan. Um, they heard about how I visited Gilmore and wanted me to visit their local history collection. Um, they were super enthusiastic and they were definitely um, the folks that they want to digitize everything. Um, so, uh, you know, I looked at, I saw everything that they had. They had a lot of enthusiastic volunteers um, and they were uh, kind of uh, ready to go. They just needed some guidance. So they're very different organizations, but the challenges really were the same. And also they shared the same desire to kind of um, share their uh, materials widely and freely. So I saw this new opportunity um, to create a new avenue for um, our regional history center um, and our archives. That's part of our mission is to be a regional history center for um, Southwest Michigan and find new ways to branch out programmatically. Um, let's just try to go forward, please. I'm not sure. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry about that. So I'll do a little um, overview of the project. Um, 
I came up with the, an idea for um, an application for the Library of Michigan's LSTA um, Providing Access Information Grant, where the idea was we were going to create a mobile digitization um, kind of stations and outfit that um, we would be able to bring to different uh, places and the digitization equipment would be very flexible and kind of a low bar to to learn how to use. Um, we also uh, were bringing to it the kind of digital infrastructure and technological know-how and expertise that we had as a, a library with digitization capacities. Um, and we were going to provide training and create documentation and have a project assistant that was going to help us um, get these uh, institutions up and running with digital collections. The idea really was more to teach people how to fish and build self-sufficiency. So the first thing we had to do was kind of define scope and set expectations. Um, we had the organizations create a um, concise collection of materials they wanted to be digitized. We really um, geared the, had them directed them to go with kind of high uh, impact visually, um, existing descriptions, um, materials that I think you kind of get the most bang for your buck. And also, of course, um, free of uh, copyright restrictions. So the Gilmore ended up um, uh, with a collection of photographs of Walt Disney visiting Kalamazoo um, that were commissioned um, and they owned all the rights to. Uh, he was visiting because apparently he and the Gilmores um, had houses next to each other in Palm Springs. Um, and then uh, the community, Richland Community Library decided to go with um, historic photographs um, that really I thought were interested in, in showing how the area has uh, grown and expanded. So the projected outcomes for our partners um, where they were gonna get this, um, a collection of high quality digital images that we were gonna host and sustain. They would be harvested through aggregates like Michigan Memories Portal and DPLA. Um, they were gonna have access to this equipment and training. Um, and we were able to um, give them all of their materials to, um, so that they had they had those to hold on to and distribute when they needed. Um, in all, we did, I think, between the two organizations, we had collections of it was 921 um, objects. And the projected outcomes for our library was we wanted to test the feasibility of kind of these on-site digitization um, services and partnerships and think more broadly about what a regional history center um, in Southwest Michigan might mean. And um, I think, you know, find different ways to build capacity to grow digital collections and improve access. So this is when I tell you that the, um, we started in October, oops, here we go. Um, October 2019, and we we're supposed to end in summer of 2020. Um, I went on maternity leave and we had a plan for how we we're going to keep going, um, but nobody ever plans for a global pandemic. So I thought I would share kind of these lessons learned um, and areas that have helped us grow as we pursue new projects like this. So first up, uh, I think it's incredibly important to manage expectations. You know, we can't digitize everything. We shouldn't digitize everything. Um, it's important to proceed, proceed in a programmatic way and be really clear about your limitations and expectations. Um, we ran into one of those incidents where it was, um, you know, uh, mom said no, so let's ask dad uh, when um, somebody was trying to finagle getting us to uh, digitize a whole run of newspapers for them. Um, it's important to be very clear in uh, your communication and really frequently and openly communicate. Um, when we worked with the Gilmore, they had just like two people that we worked with and it was very easy to kind of keep everybody on the same page. But at RCL, it was a lot of um, volunteers. 
they were going away for holidays. And um, as everybody knows, volunteer labor is wonderful, but also very susceptible to, um, you know, kind of the current conditions. And uh, it was really hard to pin down times to meet with them and kind of uh, communicate directly with them. Uh, the way I would change this moving forward is having a point person that was on staff um, at the organization um, that we would communicate with directly and um, they would kind of be the conduit to our the volunteers. Um, next, you know, document everything and anything. Um, we already, we had some materials, but in learn in going through this process and learning more and thinking about different learning styles, uh, we definitely expanded upon the materials that we've done um, so that there's really step-by-step -step guides that will help people um, move through these projects in a consistent way. And then finally, um, you know, we, we tried the train the trainer model with having a project assistant. Um, in the future, I would, uh, you know, have spend more time there. The PIs would spend more time on site with the assistant and the volunteers. I think more opportunities for um, kind of hands-on uh, training and really be, I think, clearer about some of the um, expectations and needs for us to be successful. So the takeaways uh, that I have from this, and um, my in my current position, I received a um, funding for three years uh, through a presidential innovation professorship to work with a local organization called SHARE, which is the Society for History and Racial Equity, um, to create digital collections of their oral histories and materials. Um, help them grow these collections and um, kind of create a community of practice when it comes to community driven archives and underrepresented communities. So the ways that I've kind of finessed how I how I work is um, creating a project roadmap. Um, I think it's important to clarify with the your partners what the deliverables are, what the goals are from the project, realistic timelines, even illustrate workflows. Um, it really, you know, I think builds investment that we're kind of all in this together. Um, I've taken a lot of um, time to really embed myself in the organization. I spend a lot of time on site. I do hands-on training. Um, and I really uh, stay kind of in constant communication and communicate openly with um, everybody that's participating. And then finally, I think somewhere, I, I think what we did wrong was we were focusing on this, um, our grant, it was thinking about it as a service, not so much as a partnership. And I think reframing it has been really um, helpful in, in the ways that I continue to do this uh, sort of work. I think it helps really build um, it, this investment and shared vision. Um, I, I find myself being able to co-manage uh, student assistance with um, my uh, the counterpart in SHARE. And I think it's a great growth opportunity and learning opportunity for our students. And um, it's been great in finding ways to continue to be actively engaged and move this project forward. So with that, I am going to say thank you and uh, stop so that we are on time for our next presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. And next up will be Natasha. Okay, sorry, I was so focused on my on my PowerPoint that I forgot to unmute myself and turn the camera on. Okay, so I am Natasha Hollenbach. I am the Digital Projects Manager at the Indianapolis Public Library. Um, I have been here since 2021 and I run the Digital Indie website. And what we do is we work with partners with, with partnering organizations across the city and county to digitize their materials to highlight the history and culture of Indianapolis. 
Um, we actually celebrate our 20 year anniversary next year. And in those 20 years, we have worked with over 50 partners to create over 90 collections. One of the things that makes us a little different is um, while NDPL does have a special collections and archive, they are separate from Digital Indie. So Digital Indie itself has no physical collections. So everything we digitize goes back to the collection owners and they also retain copyright. So um, when I was thinking about working with partners, one of the first things that always pops into my head is timelines. Oh, that's adorable. And this is my favorite story for how that worked. Um, so back in 2015, we were looking to you know, do a big grant idea. And eventually in 2016, we narrowed it down and we were gonna do city services. And one of those was gonna be Indy Parks and Rec. And we got that grant, which started in October, 2016. And then in November, they discovered that back in September, Indy Parks and Rec had given all of the collections to Ball State University. And so they had to kind of start all over again with Ball State University and the copyright and all the legal stuff didn't get worked out until 2018. And that was okay because it was a five and then turned into a six year grant. So it was okay that, you know, the copyright didn't get worked out until 2018. We digitized it in 2019. All the metadata and uploading happened in 2020. And then the big, um, you know, celebration for the collection launch happened in 2021. But, you know, whenever you're working with outside partners, you really do need that flexibility because, you know, being in partnership means that you lose a lot of controls over your timelines. And of course, because the materials aren't yours, you have to track collections. Um, this, this particular slide is going to be a little bit more do what I say, not what I do. Um, because I will admit we're pretty informal about keeping, about documenting and doing this kind of thing. Um, you can see on the right, we actually do have a form and this actually has a duplicate copy. So the white side goes to the collection owner and we keep the pink page. Um, but, you know, most of the organizations I work with are different enough that it's very obvious to me what collections go to go to whom. So for instance, if I have a alumni association that I'm working with, well, the yearbooks for that school obviously go to them while these newsletters that I'm doing for this neighborhood association clearly goes back to the neighborhood. There are, however, exceptions to that. Um, I did learn my lesson the hard way this year because one of our projects is actually more of an internal project and we're digitizing materials from several of our library branches and the materials are coming from both the branch and our special collections archive. Um, so I've got materials from the same, about the same location coming from two different sources um, and it's fine. And I figured out who went to who, but if I had kept, better track of it through documentation, my life would have been better. Um, the other example I have is I have a um, organization that I'm working with where we're doing multiple rounds of digitization for them. And it's really nice to have each documented so I can kind of know where any of them are on the track. Um, so since we don't keep ownership, um, we do have to have everyone sign a copyright form. And then exhibit A is where we put what exactly they've given us permission for. Uh, this is a little somewhat similar in that, you know, how deep into documentation do you want to be? Um, on the left, that's from a neighborhood organization. And of course, newsletters and board minutes, like it's very clear if you put this year to this year, that pretty much covers everything. But on the right, this was from a dance troupe called Dance Kaleidoscope. And that particular exhibit A is 63 pages of every individual photo, program, whatever that we scan for them. Um, so, you know, you really do need to think about how detailed you want your documentation to be. Then it is surprisingly difficult to get people to take their stuff back. Um, I will admit this slide is a little tongue in cheek because I was using it to work through some feelings and it was very cathartic to write it. Um, but these three boxes in this picture are absolutely level four because they have been in our cabinet since before I started. Um, they came from an organization 
Um, we digitized them back in 2019, and then we lost contact during the pandemic, and we have not been able to reestablish contact. And this is another example of where if we had better, um, you know, kind of legal arrangements, things might give us um, a better idea of what to do now, because what we should have done is have them sign something that says, if you don't pick it up within a given amount of time, we're allowed to dispose it, dispose of it. And of course we haven't. So now we're all kind of like, how long do we actually have to keep these in our cabinets? <laughs> A big thing for me though, with working with the partners is that they are the ones who know their materials. They're the ones who know their organizations. Like I wanna pull as much information out of them as I can. So some partners are really great about this. Um, this is actually a controlled vocabulary for apparatuses um, from our Firefighters Museum collection. And that is a controlled vocabulary that they created for us. And the pictures that you see is from a document that they created for us that gives us pictures of what all those apparatuses are, um, which is amazing. And if you compare that to something like these, and these are all school directories, oops. Um, so Indianapolis Public Schools started in 1873, and we've been trying to use all the directories to do a controlled vocabulary list for all the schools throughout time. And let me tell you, I desperately wish someone else was doing it. Um, because as I think we all know, sometimes there are those things that you're like, someone should have created this list, and they didn't. Um, and then of course you have kind of the descriptions of individual objects. This is a description that my collection owner wrote for one of their objects. Um, it was a radio variety show in the 90s. So I desperately needed them to write the description because I had no idea who was involved, what they were doing, what anything was called, like I needed help. And he was wonderful. But if you actually read through this, you can see that this is not really something that you would put in a library catalog or in a metadata field. Um, and in fact, I reduced it to this. <laughs> um, and this is actually, I think, his second round, which was significantly less colorful than the first round he gave me. And he was wonderful. And I told him, I'm sorry, like, this is really fun to read, but I'm going to have to drain all the color out of your writing. I'm very sorry. And he was wonderful. Um, but sometimes, you know, some people are more comfortable letting you edit their writing than others. So that is another kind of expectation that you need to set up. Um, for me, sometimes it's easier if I write a draft and send it to them for them to correct or add to. Um, at least for a lot of the organizations I work with, um, you know, they're volunteering for those organizations. You know, it's the Neighborhood Association or whatever. So they're not getting paid to do it. And so it's a lot harder for them to find time to provide this kind of information. So sometimes if I do a first draft, it makes it faster. If you do it that way, you need to give them a deadline. Say, you know, can you get this back to me within two weeks? Because if you don't, and then it takes them forever, it delays you and makes it so that you can't actually complete any of your collections because you're still waiting for feedback. <laughs> um, so usually what we do is we go, okay, so if you have any corrections, let us know. Um, we're gonna put it up in two weeks. You know, if you don't get it to, if you don't get it to us, then, you know, you can, you know, we can always correct it later. Like just make sure that, that they know it's not a, you know, speak now or forever hold your peace moment. It's a like, I just need to have a deadline. And then this is actually one of my favorite slides but I'm running out of time. Um, so maintaining contact is always a continuum. The first line is about how much material you have. And the second line is about how good our communication has been with those organizations. And it's definitely always a timeline. Um, and then of course there are takeaways, none of which are groundbreaking. And I am out of time. So I will, sorry, everybody, that is my timer going off. Um, so I will turn it over to the next person. Thank you, Natasha. Um, next up will be Anna. Hello. I will uh, 
and share my screen. It's wonderful to be here today. Thank you so much. My name is Anna Kramer, and I oversee the Texas Digital Newspaper Program out of University of North Texas Libraries. In this work, um, we digitize newspaper materials into a collection called the Texas Digital Newspaper Program on the portal's Texas history. Um, this is a Texas-wide partner-contributed digital access repository for materials related to the history of Texas. And the Texas Digital Newspaper Program um, hosts now just over 10 million pages of newspapers. Um, this is something that uh, we actually just reached about a month ago. So I was excited. This is my first time reporting on 10 million pages. These newspapers represent 209 out of the 254 counties in Texas. The collection spans from 1813 to the present, and it is contributed by partners from across the state representing 219 partner institutions. Um, the work is done through partner contributions of full newspaper collections. Mostly our partners are public libraries due to the grant funding. Um, we also coordinate with publishers, universities, government agencies like the Texas State Libraries and Archives Commission, as well as museums and societies. But I'm going to talk today about our public library partnerships as those are the primary um, group we work with. When we work with these newspapers, we receive them in physical format, microfilm issues, and PDF editions. Though the PDF editions are primarily from our state press association. Um, we will also work with uh, heavily with college newspapers in PDF edition. Um, we also, when partners request it, will coordinate with them on ingesting materials that they have digitized locally. And I'll walk you through that as well, what that looks like. Um, in our partnership models, for the most part, most of our projects, because my staff and my student workers are primarily externally funded, 80% of our projects are done through grant funding. A lot of the grants in Texas that support newspaper digitization are through different organizations that fund libraries only. And also public libraries in Texas are often, and I'm sure in, uh, throughout the country, are the repository for their city's newspapers. So a lot of this work um, winds up just naturally falling to public libraries. And as a result, um, most of my work is coordinating with public, librarian, public librarians, often library directors. Uh, when we work with them, before they can apply for a grant, there are a few documents we have to have in place, um, including the publisher permission copyright document, if the newspaper is post-public domain, which most of them are, these are entire newspaper runs, and as well as if the newspaper is still owned and in publication and or the publisher's heirs are alive. Um, we also, for the grant applications, offer a commitment letter, sort of an MOU, um, with a schedule of when work will be completed. This way, the granting organization understands that the public library is coordinating with UNT and they have a specific timeline. And then after award, we have a an institutional contract between the two institutions that is signed based on the granted grant funded materials. Um, we borrow the newspaper run from the partner um, and when we're digitizing in house. And this is a lot of trust. They are handing over their entire community history in their newspaper run to us, usually representing 100 to 150 years of history. So it's really, really important that we uh, track and handle this work in very specific ways. Um, now, in the uh, situation where the partner digitizes their newspaper in house or when they digitize with a vendor, we always try to work with them on explaining, um, in addition to a signed contract and permission, publisher permission, explaining national preservation standards, especially if they're going to digitize with a vendor. Um, happily with newspapers, we have the National Digital Newspaper Program, and there is a very um, open public national file specification for digitizing newspapers. So partners often can point their vendor to the NDNP spec 
for digitization. We do not charge institutions for adding their digital materials because the work being done was the work of scanning, getting this arranged. And we also coordinate on the timeline and getting the files uploaded. Um, we always ask the partners to provide these files to us on an external hard drive because these are ginormous files when we receive them um, scanned in-house. Um, but the things that we have to have in place uh, before they can apply for a grant anywhere is a publisher signed non-exclusive license. This doesn't sign copyright over to UNT. It simply provides permission for us to host it, as well as a project estimate from UNT and a commitment letter from UNT. And I say this, we have communicated with the granting agencies in Texas who do the most funding to public libraries. These include the Texas State Library and Archives Commission through LSTA funding, as well as the Talker Foundation and the Ladd and Catherine Hancher Foundation. We communicate with these entities to say, hey, we need these in place because um, as Natasha mentioned, we can't have something reverse looted onto us and be told, oh yeah, and we got a grant and you're gonna digitize this 100 year newspaper run um, tomorrow for us because we got a grant last year. Um, it has to be in place. We're not good with surprises in, in my newspaper unit. So we have to have this in advance and our granting agencies have been very good about communicating with us and understanding why we need this. And then locally, um, just in advance, working with our local partners, if they wanna do this in house, we ensure that they understand our file needs and how to prepare images. And then also we ask them to send us a sample image. Um, once completed, we provide a um, full copy of all files digitized to the partners on an external hard drive. These scans are not licensed, so partners can host them locally on their own repository systems. And if possible, when accepted, in most cases, very preferential, we return everything to our partners, everything that we borrowed, um, unless they want to donate them to special collections. And we also do not charge follow-up continuing fees for long-term preservation. We do guarantee this in perpetuity. We have the Kathy Nelson Hartman Portal Texas History Endowment here at UNT, where we are able to um, ensure that these collections will be preserved long-term by the University of North Texas Libraries. So our workflow, um, I'm just gonna briefly walk you through how we manage different materials. When we receive physical newspaper pages, they come to us in all kinds of states, as you can see here. This is the Jacksonville banner and the collection is 100 years of newspapers. This is just one um, shelf. And we have to work with them to arrange them. The first thing we do, if they're bound, we have a, a document I'll show you in a second. A, a permission to disbind document where we will disbind an archival box and inventory the newspapers. Um, those of you involved with NDNP will find this calendar very familiar. We can inventory everything, separate duplicates from the collection and include that inventory in the box for the partner. And then we archivally arrange them and then we queue them up for digitization on one of our scanners, depending on the, on the size of the material. For microfilm, um, we do a very similar thing. Microfilm is easy to inventory or arrange. We track every stage of the project and inventory. Documentation, documentation, documentation is the most important thing in working with partner projects. Um, we also, this is the letter for authorization to disbind. People get very scared when we say we're going to disbind your newspapers, non-destructive disbinding, long-term preservation, um, but that disbinding newspapers terrifies them. Um, so we always make sure permission is placed. We will digitize from bound volumes of newspapers, but it is definitely not preferred. Um, so if you're, and this is going to be very familiar because um, Natasha and Amy both mentioned very similar things. Make sure you defi define your project scope and timeline because so much of what we do is on grant scheduling. We have to ensure that we are meeting the grant agency's needs. We also communicate expectations. If a partner has a collection of 150 years of newspapers and we already have a lot of grant projects in place, we let them know, let's split this in half. You can apply for grant funding in another year and this year. Um, we provide documentation about the process so that they can report on this to the external agencies. We set deadlines and timelines and milestones so that our partners understand that they need to receive information from us that then also needs to get communicated externally. 
Um, and then communicating regularly is very important. I generally will send an email out once a month about project updates to my partners. There are some partners I have who will write to me daily and sometimes twice daily about updates to their collection. And managing expectations is so important. Um, I think everybody's already said that, but just saying, hey, we will communicate. Here's when we'll communicate, but we won't um, we won't communicate daily or probably not even weekly because we do. For us, we have so many uh, coals on the fire that we have to make sure that we pay attention to all of them. And then finally, um, have two contact names at an institution. Um, I have had people leave unexpectedly, and I've had, well, all their newspapers. This happened about two months ago. I have your newspaper collection to give back. Who do I talk to? And I, I've had to chase down city managers, mayors, um, when a library director has left. Um, so it's a very good way to <laughs> have a very good idea to have two um, names. So thank you. and. Um, I look forward to chatting with you. Thank you, Anna. And last but certainly not least is going to be Rebecca, whose slides I have. So let me. Hi. You see Anna, um, I have a newspaper project at Africa Picker that I'm been in the middle of for a while. And that could be a whole different presentation. So anyway, I learned a couple of things. Um, but yes, expectations are such a thing. Um, okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you to the um, Digital Library Foundation Group for having me today. Um, my name is Rebecca Van Neest, and I am the Outreach and Archives Librarian at Pompeii University in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I'm working on getting that title changed to something to do with digital projects. Um, I oversee the Institutional, institutional Repository here at Pompon, in addition to the Archive Special Collections and the website. Um, okay, background and context, first slide. Um, this is a um, photo of the Center for Botany and Studies. Um, that's a traditional coffee pot, coffee set um, from Bosnia. Um, which is kind of a coffee has like its own kind of meaning in, in Bosnia. It's kind of a very you know, central part of Bosnia ritual. Um, okay, today I'm going to talk specifically about an ongoing project that I'm managing for the Center for Bosnian Studies at And I'm going to probably spend too much time on background and context. Um, my hope here is that it will give you enough information about the scope and the challenges um, that you'll know where it might overlap with your own projects or if you want to follow up with questions or just to commiserate. Not to say that I don't love the center. This is absolutely the best part of the work that I do. Um, the center for, I'm going to give you some background here on the center in general. Um, the Center for Bosnian Studies at Pompano University's Historical and Cultural Preservation Initiative that's directed at establishing an enduring record of the experience of the Bosnian genocide survivors and their families, especially focused on those who live in the metropolitan St. Louis area, which is currently the largest population outside of Bosnia, usually numbered something between 50 and 60,000. Um, and it's kind of been a multiple waves of, of people that came as the refugees and before the war, during the war, and then kind of a secondary and tertiary from um, Europe and all over the United States, but also with clear that there was a community forming here. Um, we were originally the Bosnia Memory Project, which was founded in 2007 um, after a history class did some early oral history recordings in the previous fall. And we transitioned to a full fledged center when we got a physical space in the library. Um, and as our mission and kind of everything evolved, um, and we became more of an academic center and a place for research. We're currently involved in four major lines of activity um, the oral history program that records interviews with the genocide survivors and their relatives. Um, those um, we're the primary work of the Bosnian Memory Project, and everything has kind of grown from there. 
um, we do um, acquisition and preservation of a research collection that reflects culture and experiences of all humans, um, including photos, documents, artifacts, secondary sources, um, probably the largest secondary source collection in, the, um, in, in, kind of in North America. Um, we do some academic programming. That's kind of a piece that's evolved um, that promotes understanding of Bosnia, Bosnia, Bosnians, and um, um, Bosnian Americans. And finally, we host and sponsor events that raise awareness um, about the experiences and identity of the um, St. Louis's Bosnian population. And it's kind of in that area where um, we've really laid the groundwork for um, work with external partners and kind of where how I ended up where we are today. Over the years, we've worked with a lot of local organizations, including St. Louis Symphony Orchestra, Left Bank Books, which is an independent um, retailer. Missouri Botanical Gardens, Craft Alliance, the Meyer Sculpture Park, and the Missouri History Museum. These are major, um, important local institutions, and all of these projects that we've done with them over the years have, have just been so much more than any of us could have done individually. Um, in 2016, we got an, an NEH grant um, from the National Endowment for the Humanities, which allowed us to expand on the work that we were already starting to do with local high schools. Um, the, the high schools that are located in the areas where there's a significant Bosnian population, um, we created a, a dual credit course for those institutions, those high schools that taught about the history of Bosnia, about the history of the war. And it was kind of built around students doing their own oral histories, both with one another, and then later with members of the local community. Sometimes that was their families, and sometimes that was, it was not, and you had to kind of a large pool to pull from by that point. So that work has continued since the through the end of that grant and is still continuing. It's been an important piece of the groundwork for what we're doing today. In 2019, here we are up to the present, almost, um, we received a humanities research for the public good, a grant from for the public good grant um, from the Council of Independent Colleges. And that project sought to connect institutions with the public, like their local communities, um, in our case, the Bosnian community, through uh, undergraduate research. And the aims included working with the raw materials of humanities research, like the archives, um, expanding humanities-related skills and opportunities for undergraduate students and addressing the concerns and experiences of the public, specifically. So those aims of that grant program really inspired us to kind of think in a different way about our relationship with the community and about the way that relationship with our students worked. Um, so as we kind of move forward onto the next slide, we'll talk about um, like the, the partners and how this, this project evolved. Um, this is a list of our partners that we've worked with so far during those two different phases of this grant. During the first phase, we worked with the Cliff Cave branch of the St. Louis County Library. Um, and then in 2023, we applied for a second continuing the called sustaining grant, um, which allowed us to build on the work that we had already done. Um, and that partnered us with two of those area high schools that we were working with, Afton and Bayless High Schools, um, and the local library branches that were in their respective communities, in this case, the Cliff Cave branch again, and then the Weber Road branch in Bayless. That second phase is still in progress. It's actually for the calendar year 2023. Um, so we finished up the first phase of it um, before the summer break. And then in the fall, we're gonna continue that with the high school program um, and work with a nursing home, um, like a residential care facility that has a significant Bosnian population. The, the real work of this, of this grant from the beginning has been, about, has been a community archiving initiative so we're really looking to, to grow those, the collections of the center by collecting items that, um, that people have in their homes um, to share with the community and with the, with the research, with the scholars, um, and to make that available. Um, maybe that means that they donate it to the center. Maybe it means they bring it into an archiving event at the library and we scan it, um, photograph it, um, write about it, interview them about it. We've done a lot of little kind of micro histories about items in that, um, that, that people have brought. Um, so that, that's the kind of work that we're doing. We're doing that with the high school students that we're having. We're bringing in students from the high school program who are 
and doing that that partnership um, with us. So they're actually taking the, the the they're doing the oral histories, they're taking the notes, they're filling out the spreadsheets, they're doing the scans and the photographs um, in the library space. Um, so like I said, this is still in progress. Um, before we leave this slide, I just want to call your attention to the photo here. Um, this is from a community a community archiving event that we did at the Cliff Cove branch as part of that first phase in December 2022. Okay. I really want this to be like, I'm not taking too much time. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do this quickly, but I just want this to be a cautionary tale and I want it to be a source of hope. Um, so the original, if you remember the original date, it was 2019, and the date of that exhibit or that that event was 2022. COVID got in the way, um, and that is going to give you a sense of where we went from there. Um, originally, we had worked with the library to set up um, to, to to develop an internship program. They taught a course, we had interns that came in, they developed a physical exhibit that went into the library. They displayed the exhibit for, you know, for the course of the, um, kind of the end of the semester through the summer. Um, and then I would create an online version of that exhibit to have for posterity and, you know, kind of to have a record of it. Um, so it's really great that the grants provide this, this opportunity for structure and accountability. And this is one of the reasons that I, I think there's just such a great idea for this kind of thing. Um, but they, they also, things are always going to get in the way. And it's not necessarily going to be a pandemic, but if things do come up. Um, it caused um, things to shut down, right? So the library, the library stopped all public programming for the entire course, not just in the fall, but well into the spring. Um, Periodic meetings keep everyone on track. I'm just going to go through this slide quickly and we'll be kind of done. Um, keep everyone on track. Um, our director was in London. She went to London for three months. She got held up there during the pandemic. So all of a sudden we had to you know, figure out a new way to communicate. Um, in the meantime, um, our primary um, person who had founded the Bosnian Memory Project, our faculty member who was who was originally on the grant, had retired. Um, so everything got changed. Um, The scheduling got changed. Okay, um, the programming was canceled. Um, one of the most important things I think that I want to um, you know call out today is to keep everything in the same place, especially if you've got people in different places, especially with community partners. But um, we had people in London, and we had people in we had. Um, it's useful not just for that, but it's also useful for like things like performance reviews and for like dossiers if you are your you know um, faculty. Um, and I'm not we're not perfect at this either. We um, I just realized while I was putting this together and looking for photos and things that the Excel document in Google Drive, which is the, the product that we're using to kind of keep track of all the of all the actual files, um, is not in place. Right, it's going like the, it's actually on the intern's computer that he's using, and so we're all somewhere. Um, Know your tools. We bought new tools um, for the um, for the, the work at the library. We bought a, a light box. We bought a digital camera. We bought a, a handheld scanner. Um, and you know, we were learning how to set things up right, kind of on the fly, um, which is fine. It was fine in, in, in that particular day, but it is really fun. Okay. Um, and do whatever you can, do as much as you can um, to, you know, in real time as they're happening, you know, scan that form and then have that file ready before you leave. Um, fill in the spreadsheet as, as you go and, you know, don't like take notes and then make say you're going to fill in the spreadsheet later. Okay, I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to pull back and hopefully that's enough for you all to get to questions and follow up. So. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you to all of our speakers today. That was all very interesting.